Hey folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to episode two of what I think will be a three episode mini series on setting up a very basic application where we have a Unity game client that communicates to a web server uh, and can pass information back and forth. This mini, this three episode mini series will hopefully then be followed up with additional mini series that expand on that. But we're going to try to keep the scope on every single one of these little mini projects as tight as possible. In the last episode, we used node.js to set up a simple server and we were testing it with the web browser. And I was confused as to why this number was going up by two every time I refreshed the page. Interestingly enough, this problem was not happening when I loaded the page in Firefox. And I was curious to why. So I opened up the console over here in uh, in Google Chrome to see what was going on, check the network tab, and we can see it actually makes two requests from the server every time we load the page. It makes a request for the page itself, and then Chrome then goes and makes a request for favicon.ico. This is why when you surf the web, your browser tabs will have a little bit of an icon over here, and most websites will have a custom icon for the site in that corner is because of favico. So every time I load this page, Chrome actually it makes two hits over here. The first time, it gets um, the actual web page, um, or I guess, yes, the first time it gets the actual web page, which is why it starts at one, but then it makes a second request to the favico, which triggers exactly the same code over here. Um, and so this request for a favorite icon returns this text over here that the browser clearly can't do anything with, but it still increments the counter by one. So that's why it was going one, three, five, seven, etc. is because of the extra request from that. Mystery solved. Boy, oh boy, that was driving me nuts. Maybe you, none of you guys cared, but maybe you will because it is actually interesting to remember that we're going to get this request no matter what address we put in. If I go over here and I put in the address of blah, 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 blah. I get exactly the same page because I'm not actually parsing the URL or doing anything with it. Literally any request that hits the server gets the exact same response, which is this thing over here. All right, now we're gonna delete everything we did in the last episode, hooray. So I'm going to take this file and I will in fact just delete it over here and that's gonna be fine. So once again, I've got a completely blank and empty project over here for us to get started. Now we are going to continue by using the express module to handle our HTTP request. It's gonna handle a lot of things for us, including for example, gracefully handling errors. Like if someone tries to access a page that doesn't exist, it also makes it a lot easier for us to serve, serve static content. For example, if we actually did have a favorite icon or just images or style sheets or something we're trying to send, uh, we don't want to have to handle that through programming. Instead, we want to send an actual physical file on the computer and send it that way. And this actually could be relevant for a Unity application because uh, depending on what our application is, we might have things like images, for example, stored on the server that we have to send to the game client for Unity to use after the fact. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop over here. I'm going to kill my application. There we go. Um, and we're going to get set up for this project a little bit more. So we're back to an empty folder and there's no reason I can't just start typing text again in the text editor. But what I'm gonna do to start off first is I'm gonna run npm and I'm gonna type in it. This is going to initialize the folder for a slightly more structured project. All it's gonna be doing for us is making a single text file. It's gonna ask me some questions uh, to, uh, to, to populate this package.json file. Uh, it wants to know the name of the package. I guess some server seems fine. I'm just gonna hit enter and accept that. Version one seems okay. Um, this is going to be server for a Unity application. It's gonna be the description, entry point. So this is asking us what our main file will be called. Um, I see a lot of different conventions in Node uh, for different things, especially if you're using something that sets up an automatic skeleton for you. For example, if you were to use the express helper tool to uh, more completely populate your starter project, I think it might use app.js, which is quite good. I think I'm gonna say my main file, I'm gonna call it server.js, just because. So I'm going to call it that. Uh, we're not. We're, we may do some tests later, but for now I'm going to leave this blank. Uh, I will populate a Git repository later on because this project will be found on Git. You can find the information down in doobly doo. But I'm going to skip it. Skip the keywords. Author, I guess, is going to be Quill18. Uh, license. Um, I'll probably change this because I th I think we'll probably go with a um, like GPL 3.0 or something. Maybe I'll type that in. Oh, uh, oh, there you go. GPL 3.0 or later. 
and we can we can tweak all these as well. That'll be your file. So all it's doing is creating a text file for us, package.json, and it's got some information in here for us. We're going to be making a few tweaks to these going forward, but the reason we need to do this now is because one of the most important blocks of information, or I don't know if it's the most important, well, uh, maybe. One of the blocks that does the most in your project is a block of code in here called dependencies. Dependencies list the modules that your project is going to depend on. Basically, the, the code libraries that you're going to use within your project. Now, you can go and make your own dependencies block over here, but one of the cool things is we can keep using NPM over here to do that. For example, absolutely, we are going to use a library called Express. So I'm going to go NPM install Express. It's going to hit the interwebs and download this module and do a little bit of work for us. It's actually created a couple of things here. It has created a folder called node modules. It's created a file called package.lock, and it's also modified our package.json. If I take a look at the node modules folder, there's a bunch of stuff in there. I guess I could just force a habit to do it that way. There's a bunch of extra folders in there. And that's because Express itself has its own dependencies. Express is installed over here, but it relies on all these other little dependencies over here, these little modules. Um, it is quite common in, well, in programming in general, but especially with these sorts of open source projects and things like that, that you have a lot of very small, very highly focused modules. It is a good idea to um, to avoid monolithic libraries. And in fact, same thing when you write your own code. Try not to make your f any single function do too much. Try not to make any single class do too much. Keep everything extremely small and tight and then call on each other. It makes it a lot easier to maintain. So this is totally fine that Express has added a bunch of things because, you, I mean, to a certain extent, these are, are kind of just subclasses or even in some cases, basically just functions that belong to Express um, or that Express would use as a function. But these exist independently and can be used by you to do different things. We could have pulled these each in individually. So the other thing has happened. So this got installed, right? Node modules. The other thing that I said happened, our package.json file, there's been a change. This new dependencies block has appeared over here. And all this does is list, again, which modules your application will use and depend on. Uh, the version that got installed on our computer here is 4.17.1. The little caret here says that in the future, you can actually install any version of Express, as long as it is fully compatible with 4.17.1. For example, if the, the maintainer of Express comes out with a 0.2 or a 0.3 version that fixes some bugs, but is otherwise completely compatible, in when we uh, reran the NPM script to install and update our modules, it might update Express to the new version, even though it's not exactly the same number as we've got over here. There's, uh, you can look up the documentation for package.json and see how it treats dependencies. There's a bunch of little indicators and things that you can use over there to control that. But by default, when you install a module in the command line, it grabs the most recent version of that module and then tags it like this to say, uh, but if there's stuff in the future, as long as it's backwards compatible, hey, go nuts. So um, that is all installed. Now, we don't actually have to install it using npm install. It's quite convenient to install things this way, but it's not the only way. And I'm going to show you that. If I go, I'm going to delete the node modules. I'm also going to delete a uh, package lock.json. So the only thing we have in our folder is this package.json. And let's assume I type this out manually. I manually typed out dependencies, express, and I specified a version number. Then when I go over here, I type npm install. And then I just hit enter. It's going to read package.json, look at the list of all the modules that are specified in dependencies, and then install them, which is exactly what happened. And either way, we are in exactly the same situation that we were a second ago with the node modules and this package lock file. We can take a pack look at package lock. What this does is it really specifies exactly where the files came from um, and uses some internal hashing to make sure that the file is, is intact and correctly installed on your computer. When we are going to go and commit this to a Git repository or any versioning system you're going to use to track your project. Um, you do, in fact, you don't, you want to ignore the modules, the node modules folder, but you don't want to ignore package.lock. This um, might be a little counterintuitive to people who have worked with various other environments and things before. You actually do want to commit package-lock um, to your repository. Um, is what I've read. I don't. I don't know enough about the nitty gritty about things to really describe things. Um, this. This is a little out of scope to do the, the git ignore over here. 
But git ignore is a file that git will use, and it just says which files and things to ignore. Um, I, I can't remember if I need a different syntax for a folder, but we're basically going to tell it again. Don't type this because I, I suspect I might be wrong um, about this, and I'm going to be grabbing a more complete git ignore file. In fact, what I typically do for my projects, and again, I know I'm sidestepping a little, is um, I set up a git a repository on GitHub. When you create a new repository on GitHub, it gives you the option of starting the repository with a readme file, but also a git ignore file. And if from the git ignore, there's a pull down menu that lets you choose what your programming environment is. For example, you can pick Unity and it will make a git ignore file that's well suited to Unity, but it also includes one for Node.js and it will make one that's well suited to Node.js. It will ignore everything that really does not belong in the actual repo itself. Because the thing is, if you were to go and if you wanted to, you know, let's say we finish this Gessam server thing and someone want to take this Gessam server application and install it on their own folder. What they would do is they would download the, the files from the repo, you know, one of the releases or they would, you know, do a git pull or however they want to do it. Right. They would yank all those files, put it on their computer. It wouldn't come with node underscore modules. But what would they would do after the folder was on their computer? They would simply go into their their thing over here and they would type um, npm install. It would just read the package file and install any missing patches at that point. Uh, and it would be perfectly compiled for their computer. And because some of these things do get compiled, in fact, um, or organized in some way. So it would be perfectly suited to their environment, their operating system, etc. Anyway, getting a little uh, sidetracked over here. I'm going to remove that yet ignore file uh, because we'll move on to other things. So the big thing is now what we have is we have Express installed in our project um, and it is ready to go. And we said that our main file would be server.js. So let's make a file called server.js. And this is gonna be, this is the entry point for our whole application, right? The application starts here. And we're going to have lots of other JavaScript files, especially as this tutorial series continues on to other mini series, but it's still everything is going to run from here first. And the first thing we're going to do is whoops, we're going to pull in uh, the Express app or the Express library require Express. This will fail if we haven't done the NPM install, but we have, so it should be OK. And then I believe the next step is we're going to instantiate uh, the app from this. I think by doing this, let me take, take a second and bring up the documentation. OK, yeah, I just want to double check that I wasn't doing a basic screw up over here and then we'd have to back up a bit. So, yes, we brought in the module and we've started this application. So uh, the process for building the web server using Express is slightly different than if we we're doing the raw HTTP, but you'll still feel pretty similar basically at this point. So we've started this app object and now what we're going to do is we're going to define um, responses, right? Before what we had is we set up that HTTP dot create server. Okay. So the autocomplete is, is getting all borky here. Uh, create server. And the thing we pass to it is a function that would respond to literally every single request that the server would get. Basically it was going to be our responsibility in our previous code. Don't write this code down, by the way, this is, this is not what we're actually doing in our previous code. It was our going to be our responsibility to look at the request dot. I don't remember what it was. URL, the, the autocomplete won't work because I'm not actually doing it properly here, but we're going to look at the URL, the address, and we're going to have to look at that, you know, to split up the URL that you would see up over here to figure out what kind of code was supposed to run, right? If we're supposed to do, you know, foo bar baz would be different than, you know, accessing some other page, for example. Um, so we would have to do that ourselves. But one of the big things that Express does for us, for example, is handle parsing of the URL for us automatically. So it's still going to look a little bit similar, but we're going to do an apt dot get. Now, oh, let me let me continue and we'll see exactly what we're talking about afterwards. And we're going to do an anonymous function. We're still going to do a request and a response. I'm going to use the Lambda sy syntax again because I think it's quite cool. OK, so this this should rhyme with what we did in the previous episode. But the difference is that here we are specifying two things. First of all, we're specifying a URL. For example, we might want this to own um, foo bar baz. So now this will only respond to requests that match this URL over here. Uh, if we put down the slash, then it will just respond to that that base URL. Um, but there's another part, this get over here. So this is in 
HTTP protocols, there are a number of kind of action verbs that the client can send to the server. Get is by far the most common one. When you type an address in your title bar over here and hit enter, the server does a get. By the way, this, this won't respond because the server is not running right now. The server does a get request. Uh, it, it's trying to get a document from the server. Um, the second most common that you will likely see is post. It look exactly the same in terms of express how we would you know do this um, post is used when the client is sending a bunch of information to the server for example the typical use case for it, the classic one is when you fill out a form on a web page and then hit that submit your browser will do a post because you can send let's say you're it's a form that's asking for your your name and email address and things it is possible it's quite common in fact that you will see um, some extra properties get sent along with a get. You'll see this question mark and you know, you'll have like username equals quill, uh, password equals hunter two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, equals, et cetera, that those sorts of things, right? You'll, you'll see this sort of thing happen. Um, but there's a few reasons why there are certain types of information you don't want to stick in here. And it's not, it's not security, although that's certainly part of it. Uh, but posts aren't necessarily inherently more secure or anything like that. It's that, these sorts of things can become unwieldy, especially if there's a large amount of information. It's really inconvenient if, for example, you're trying to upload a um, an image or a video or something to a website. The get has certain limitations in length. Um, also, it really gets kind of screwy if like someone goes like backwards and forwards again in their browser because it's sort of well probably the browser would still have a cache, but if it doesn't, it would sort of resend this get request, which might submit a form more than once, which is uh, why this, this, this form is still this form of passing extra parameters to get is still really useful and used all the time for like a million billion things. But with a post, what will happen is it won't actually be in the URL. Although even in a post, you can still send some parameters this way. That's totally okay. But the parameters will also be accessible in a different way as part of the request object. Um, there's actually a bunch of these different HTTP verbs and you can go ahead and just Google that and you'll see the list of them. And we may make use of them um, going forward because there's actually verbs for, um, for all kinds of like updating and delete records and things like that. And there's no reason you can't do all of that through here. Like your get could be something like action equals, oops, uh, I didn't need backspace all that action equals update, right? Or action equals delete. You can do that, but you can also use the actual HTTP verbs to do it in a, a kind of a, a, a sexier, cleaner way. Anyway, moving on. It's a lot of talk for like four lines of code. <laughs> um, so moving on now, what we've got is this is going to respond to anything that goes to this URL and we can just, um, send a response back really easily. And we can just send a response back really easily with send. And it'll look the same as before. Hello world. In fact, we could even do like user number uh, plus count dot two string, which won't do anything because we don't actually have a uh, var count equals zero count plus plus. The nice thing about this is it should only go up by one every time because this should not, I think, respond to fav icon dot ico let's see what this looks like oh i have to run the server again so okay here's the thing i can still run the server all right we can check our files here i can still run the server by saying node server.js we're actually going to see if there's an error actually there's going to be a couple of things wrong i'm realizing because i'm not done my program yet but count has already been oh okay i guess visual studio code went ahead and uh defined something for me already I guess it, it saw this and it decided to autocomplete some stuff for me. That's real sweet of it. But I go back over here. There you go. Uh, this is going to start. It's going to compile properly. No syntax error and then exit immediately. It's because we haven't, we haven't actually started to listen with this application yet. So we have to say app dot listen, list, listen. Um, and again, we should, uh, there's got a bunch of variants of it, but we should at very least um, put in a port number. I think that's all we need to run it. I don't think we need to put in the callback. Let's see what this looks like over here. If I start this up, yeah, it doesn't show us anything. We could I'll tell you what, let's, um, let's go ahead and add the callback because I don't like that it doesn't say anything. So we're gonna make a little Lambda style callback over here, console.log server has started. I don't like it when it doesn't say anything to us. That's kind of boring, isn't it? 
come back over here, run you, server has started, excellent, we'll bring up the web browser, I'm gonna refresh the page, one, two, three, see this? The numbers are properly going up, and the reason for it is that we are only responding to this exact URL. If I type in something else, um, ba -da -da -da, cannot get, there's nothing that's listening to this. Now, we could make a little change in our code, um, where are we over here? We could make a little change in our code. I believe uh, we could put like star. There's, there's actually a couple of different formats that we could put in there. I think star will do it. Let me change. Actually, let me run it manually one more time over here. Run this again. There we go. So now it's responding to any URL we put in whatsoever. It's going to get that perfect. Interestingly, it's still not double counting. The favicon.ico must be, uh, must be, um, asking for it in a slightly different way that's causing it to not trigger this, but that's okay. Uh, let's not worry about that. Um, so yeah, this will return the response to anything, but we could also put in other things, right? We could put in specific things in here, like only respond to a request for the user's folder for some reason. Uh, once I'll, one more time, I'm going to manually restart this, then we're going to make some changes. So now it's not listening to the base, but if we put in slash users, Hey, look at that. It's responding to this. Cool. We are not going to want to list every single action we respond to in this file. Uh, in fact, we're going to want to do it in a few different ways. So don't worry, but uh, we'll get to that very soon. So I said I no longer want to be able to, to run or to restart the page manually. So obviously I can just go back to running this with Nodebond. 100% I could do this and this 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 will work fine. And then it'll watch and, and wait for refreshes. But what we're going to do is we're going to start the application in a different way. You can start your application with npm start over here. Rather than using node to specifically run a file, we're going to run npm start. And what this is going to do, this is going to load up package.json and start the application that way. So you can see here, it started the project, boom, uh, and then server has started, which comes from our code over here, and it is running just fine. Now, how does npm start know what code to run? Well, that comes to the package over here. See how we've got this main over here? Because it's got this entry for main, it knows that we need to run server.js. It will run this simply by executing node space server.js. But this means it, we're not running with nodemon. How do we get to run with nodemon? Well, we can actually put an explicit script. Because what happens over here, when we run node start, it looks for a script in here called start. If it doesn't have one, it falls back to main, I guess is the way it works. But we can run node test, because there's a script in here called test. And it's going to throw an error in here. Um, well, actually, is it because of this? Cannot find module test. Oh, that's interesting. I thought it would have just spit out this code over here. I right, listen, I'm not going to worry about it too much because we're not bothering with that. I'm going to put my hands in the right place on the keyboard and we are going to make a new script called start, which is going to run nodemon, nodemon server.js. And assuming I've done that vaguely correctly, now when we run npm start, oh, I'm an idiot. It's because I was running node test instead of npm test. There we go. See, npm test. Now it's saying error no test specified. I was typing the wrong thing. Um, but now if I run npm start, it's going to run this version over here that starts nodemon for us. And that's going to be very, very handy. So npm start is your more typical way. You can you can have npm start do a ton of things for you, and it, it can read a lot of contextual stuff about your application. So npm start is probably how we want to start your app. And so if you want to start it with node daemon or nodemon, you can do it that way. So now our application, once again, running, everything is groovy. Okay, so where are we at over here? Uh, so we're now running with, uh, oh yes, so we're now running with Express, which is great. What we don't want to do though, we're not interested in just sending back text or HTML or anything like that. We want to send data. This, this web server we're working on is not actually going to serve a regular web page, although it could. Um, for example, Imagine we were, so the Unity program we're running, right? Our game that we're running, like you can just download as a Windows EXE and run it. And then it's going to run and communicate to our server. It's going to have the address of the server somewhere in its code. And it's going to, it's going to access the server that way for whatever we're doing with the server stuff. Uh, no nope, microtransactions because we're an evil company. <laughs> um, you know, whatever it is, it's just going to access the server that way. But conceivably you could also run Unity as a WebGL application, right? There's no problem there. And in theory, the application could just live 
could you could just upload it to a regular web server that's running Apache or, or whatever it heck it is and putting it there. But the other thing is Node.js is a web server by itself, well, with Express and everything like that. So we can actually serve it here. You could imagine we have a folder inside the Gessman server uh, called, I don't know, like static. Some some things are use, use um, public, some things use... There's different naming conventions for different applications, but let's say we have this folder called static. The idea is this is static content, right? Uh, so we're going to have stuff like, um, you know, logo.png. Uh, I mean, I'm just making a dummy text file here, so none of this is going to work properly, so ignore it, but it's going to have that. And then it'll have some sort of, um, you know, the unity game dot unity or whatever the, the thing, you know, it, this static can have that. And the great thing is we can have um, we can have Express serve static content for us very, very quickly. I'm going to ignore that for now. We're going to come back to this. Well, I don't know if we're going to come back to this within the, the scope of our particular tutorial, but your Express server can, can serve all the static content, which means your WebGL Unity application can live in that same host. So you're going to put in, you know, mycoolgame.com and you can have it so that your Unity's or your Express base thing, right? With a regular get, you have it something like um, uh, mycoolgame.com was accessed via web browser. So serve up um, the static content for our WebGL Unity application, right? This aspect here, this is not really a web server code that we're running, right? The actual like providing people an HTML page that has the WebGL Unity content put in there. They're just static files that you just uploaded via FTP, but this can serve it. In fact, that's what a web server typically does, just send files to a client, right? But then every uh, the rest of the meat of our application will be doing server-based shenanigans. So um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I can keep this. Hello, here is your Unity uh, WebGL game, except obviously it's not going to do anything right now, but there it is. So let's look at this user's things. Let's say um, this thing's job, um, return a list of all users currently log into the game or, or whatever. I, I don't know what this is going to be, right? But imagine this is some sort of data we want to send back. Now, this could be, we could return a web page, a nicely formatted web page with a list of things, but that's not the role of our application. The role of our application is going to be to return data that our Unity client will be able to use for whatever purposes. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to have some sort of, some sort of object. Um, you know what, let's say like user, this is um, uh, return the user's info of wins, losses, etc. right? This is in Unity, uh, someone's clicking on their, their user profile to find out how they've, how well they've done. So we want to return some data to them. So we're going to do that now, normally, um, the goal will be to read this from some sort of database, right? But for us right now, we're going we're gonna to ignore the database side of it. Again, I'm going to try real hard not to overinflate the scope of this too quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to return some data that we just made up on the fly, right? So this is our, our dummy data that we're creating. And I'm just going to populate an object here. So we're going to have something like... Um, Username is Quill18. Uh, wins 18. Losses 1,000. That that's that sound that sounds about right to me. So assuming I've got my syntax right, what I have here is an object that we can do something like dummy data dot username. Oh, losing losses. There you go. Um, I can do something. In fact, I will do. Give me one sec. Let's do res.send. So theoretically right now, and 
I have Nodemon running, which is groovy over here. Uh, you might still want to check your console because if, if it fails to sort of recompile the code, you might get a syntax error over there. So it's good to check that. If I go to the browser, and if I just load the base URL, it says, hello, here is your Unity WebGL game. Again, the idea is we're going to serve some static content on this. But if I go slash user, it now says Quilly Teen. OK, good, good. So far, so groovy. Um, but what I'm actually going to want to do is send this entire object formatted via JSON. So JSON, JSON is, I think, JavaScript object notation. It's basically just a very simple way to take a JavaScript object and convert it in text. And it's very easy to um, convert it to text and, in fact, go from text and convert it back to a JavaScript object. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can send data back and forth over the net. I mean, you could do some sort of binary formatting. You can use some XML. You can do whatever. JSON is really great because it's actually super simple. It's very, very basic, very easy to work with. It's also it just very naturally works inside of um, inside of JavaScript because it just I mean, it, it completely 100% mirrors a JavaScript object, um, and that's where it came about. Um, but it's proven to be very popular in all kinds of applications that don't have anything to do with JavaScript whatsoever. It's also really human readable, which is kind of wonderful, and it's, it's one of the big attractive parts to things. So all we have to do to send JSON back is this. Instead of response.send, we response.json. Um, and we can just you can just put anything in here you want, but let's go and just put in our object. So our dummy data object over here, we're gonna have it just outputted as JSON. And if I flip back over to my web browser, if I can find that, if I refresh this, there we go. That is what a JSON object looks like. In fact, if I were to go back into my code and just change this, which this is gonna result in exactly the same code. Uh, the advantage of using the quotation marks over here is you can use like, symbols and, and spaces and things that wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be otherwise legal, right? So if I do this and I refresh this, nothing should change here. In fact, it doesn't. But if you compare the two, that's that's literally what I put in um, with with the JSON parsing. It do, if it does detect that it's just a number, it doesn't bother putting the quotation marks over here. So it does that. Um, actually, I think it is a little bit context aware. If I put quotation marks around the 18 here, I think it would actually, yeah, put that as a string over there. So because there's a slight difference, but that will work. So anyway, that is groovy. So now all we have to do is get Unity to read this data. And that's not going to be all that hard. And all of a sudden, we've literally got an application that can talk to web server and get data from it. And um, we'll, uh, we'll practice with uh, putting in parameters over here, like sending sending parameters as part of the request. In fact, I can do that now. Hang on a second. Let me show you. Let me show you a thing. I thought I was going to end the video now. But um, what you can do is there's a special syntax over here that you can do this. Uh, and then what this will happen is uh, rec.params um, id, I think. Dot ID? No, you're not happy about that either. Hang on a sec. I thought that was correct. Oh! It's not supposed to have a semicolon here. It's just a colon or comma. No. All right. Hold on. Let me try this. I think this is correct. Let's find out. So if I go back to my web browser and I put in some sort of ID, uh, my ID is foo. There you go. Right. So this is clearly reading in a parameter from this request over here and doing this. So there's a bunch of different ways that our Unity application will be able to send information to the web server, right? Because maybe it wants to update, it wants to save something. Again, some of it might be done via a post, which means it won't actually show up as part of the request URL. But for very simple requests, there's no reason we can't have stuff in there. And you can actually read multiple things. Um, you can absolutely in your code over here have this um, something other thing. And those will all show up in this. So you can very easily pass for when it, when it comes to simple information that you want to get from the client. This is a really, really easy way to get some of that over there. 
So again, the, the user ID is obviously, you know, we're not reading a user ID because it's just, it's just this, but hey, it works. It works beautifully and it's going to be really easy to pull this into Unity. Thanks a lot for watching, folks. See you next time. This episode is brought to you by the incredibly awesome and incredibly patient people who support me over at patreon.com slash Creates, and that includes our mic check supporters. We've got David Crew, Ilunda, Julian Gallic, Thomas, Jeff Fellows, Tiberon, Pavel Zdanoff, Michael McClintock, and Steven Steger. Uh, again, thank you very much for your patience in finally getting this thing out, and uh, I hope you guys do make it to the uh, London Dare streams as well when they happen. The last one was pretty epic, still working on the post-mortem for that. Stay tuned.